I give these talks and and uh, I already said I could give a little bit of background on how I got to be here today. Um, we we made this film and I'll tell you how it came about. And we I left uh, Los Angeles after Yom Kippur with my wife to sort of tour around and premiere the film. We did a sneak preview in Cincinnati, Ohio, where my wife is from. And then we went on to Woodstock, New York, where we had the official world premiere of the film to a full house and was followed by a, a concert of uh, music by my grandfather. And it was really just a great event. Uh, and then we hopped on a plane and went to Zurich, Switzerland. And in Zurich, we had at the Zurich Film Festival, our, our uh, international premiere, uh, European premiere, which also went really well. It was in a beautiful theater, uh, sort of state of the art and enormous screen, it was super, also followed by music. And then uh, the director of Matthew Mishori, who I'll tell you about in a minute, uh, he and I went on Friday, last, what, what day is it today? <laughs> uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, something like that, um, Wednesday. Uh, so last Friday, we went to Tel Aviv and I arrived uh, late in the afternoon. I rented a car and I drove down to um, to the South to visit uh, my my wife Pam's first cousin Mitch Weisberger and his wife Tracy and their four daughters who are age I think like 22 20 16 13 something like that um, and uh, they made Aliyah and they lived down in uh, a settlement called Evan Shmuel a city called Evan Shmuel it's right next to a giant Intel factory I've never seen anything quite like it uh, if you're in Orange County, you ever drive up to LA past City of Commerce, it looks as big as the entire City of Commerce. Uh, it's unbelievable. Anyway, I went to their house and had a wonderful Shabbat dinner and talked about all sorts of things. And um, at 11.30, I left and went back to Tel Aviv and went to sleep. Now, that that home that I had Shabbat dinner in was 20 miles from Starot. Um, and seven hours after I left, uh, Starot and so many other villages on the border with Gaza were attacked. Uh, I was in my bed in a nice hotel in Tel Aviv and I heard the siren go off. And since I had arrived very late at night, I really didn't even know the hotel so well. Didn't know what to do. And I just sort of slept, well, stayed in bed through it. I heard big bangs and explosions. And uh, But then I thought as a Southern Californian, it felt to me like I was in an earthquake, right? And if you survive the earthquake after a minute and it's over, you seem, okay, well, there's nothing else I can do. And at least I'm alive. And so I, I sort of was not as worried um, as I later became because um, I found out actually the explosion was less than a mile away from me where it, it destroyed a building. And uh, and then throughout the day, all the events that everybody I'm sure has been following um, came to light. So uh, I Matthew, Mishori and I then the we tried to find uh, that evening, we tried to start looking for a way out uh, because the, the screening that was scheduled on Sunday was canceled and we got a flight, uh, as Ari mentioned, to Madrid on Monday. Um, but before we left, we decided to do a private screening for the Anu Museum. Anu um, used to be called Beit HaFutzot. It the, was the Diaspora Museum. Now it's been rebuilt and rebranded. Uh, it's a museum on the the uh, campus of Tel Aviv University. And it's called Anu, like we in Hebrew, and it's the Museum of the Jewish People. And uh, and I had been involved with them. I visited them the first time I went to Israel in 1985 and, and uh, or sorry, 89, I think was the first time. And I was familiar with their genealogy program because I've been an avid genealogist since I was a little kid. And, um, and more recently, when they when they announced they were revamping it, I contacted Anu and asked to develop a genealogy application, which I can tell you about also, uh, maybe after we talk about the film. And so I was very excited to go to Anu and see the unveiling, basically, of not only the movie, but also this genealogy application web app that allows you, if you are um, if you have a family tree on genie.com, you can find out how you're related to all the people on display in the museum, as well as all the people walking around the museum who are also on the app. So I was very excited for that. And that that got canceled. So Matthew and I decided to offer a private screening to the, the 300 or so guests who had been um, been expected to come. And uh, we had about 100, 150 of them, I think, showed up. Um, and they watched the movie uh, on online. And we thought uh, it would be you know, not for everybody because some people have much more serious things going on. But even if, even for those who 
had serious things going on. Uh, by Sunday evening, it was time for maybe a couple of hours not watching uh, the horrible images on TV and some people needed a break. And so that went very, very well. We had a nice discussion afterwards. And, and then the following day, Matthew and I were able to, to leave uh, from the airport and uh, and fly to Madrid. So uh, today I came here to Vienna, uh, which is where I had hoped to be anyway. And I'm here to to give you this wonderful talk. Uh, as Ari mentioned, one of the purposes of the talk is to let people know if you're in Orange County, um, like Ari is, to uh, to come on the 19th on Thursday, October 19th, to Newport Beach Film Festival, where we're having our California premiere. Um, if you missed that, there's Another chance uh, in downtown LA at the Doc LA, uh, I think it's a landmark theater down down in LA Live, downtown LA. Um, that's on October 29th on a Sunday evening, I believe. So uh, so hopefully this is a way to get uh, get out the word from that, and I'll be coming back on Monday and hope to see maybe some of you at the film. So let's talk about the film. It's called Fioretta. Uh, that's the name of a. a very distant ancestor that we find. And I'll, I'll tell you how the film came about. Uh, it was in 2021, right? So the second summer of COVID when we could uh, travel a little bit and I went and took my family to Italy. My father's sister married an Italian, a Venetian composer, Luigi Nono. And, and so she lives in, in Italy and my two cousins, her daughters also live in Venice and Rome. And so we met them and as I often do, uh, because I've been a genealogist for a long, long, long time. Uh, I talk about genealogy. And so I mentioned to my cousin Serena, who's a little older than I am, maybe just one or uh, two years older. And she she's an artist, a painter, and a, she's made films also. And I mentioned to her that, that I think I could trace our family back through one line, uh, all the way back to the beginning of the ghetto in Venice, to a Venetian Jewish family in, in Venice. And I thought she might be interested since she's born uh, in Venice and has lived there her whole life. And she was, and she said, you know, that might make an interesting documentary film. And I thought, well, you know, I'm obviously addicted to my own genealogy. Like most people who do genealogy, it's a very narcissistic, all about me uh, pursuit. But uh, I, I didn't really ever consider the possibility that someone else might be interested, even people, people beyond my family, because even in my family, a lot of people aren't so interested. So uh, anyway, I, I thought it was it was funny that she mentioned it. And then on the way back to, to Los Angeles, we actually stopped in Cincinnati for my in-laws. And I got a, a, a text or an email from an old high school friend of mine named Brad Schley, who's a movie producer. And it, I think it was on a Friday. And he said, are you busy on Monday? I said, no, why? And he said, well, I need you to come over to the house. We're making a film and I need to interview you. I said, well, about what? He said, well, I'll let you know when you get there. And uh, are you available? And I said, well, I'm supposed to come home Sunday. Okay, why not? I have nothing planned on Monday. So I went over to, to my friend Brad's on Monday. And he and this filmmaker, uh, Matthew Mishori, were, were filming a documentary. And they told me it was about, it was about a, a couple, a German-Jewish couple. They both had fled the Nazis in the 1930s and come to New York. Uh, the husband was a doctor, and and uh, they lived in New York for many years, and then they they moved out uh, and retired in San Diego, had sort of a condo or a little home there, and apparently when they were in their late 80s, a neighbor had a visit from a fundraiser for Ben Gurion University in the Negev, and the neighbor said, oh, maybe you should meet my my uh, neighbors, the Marcuses. So the fundraiser went next door and met the Marcuses. And and it told them about Ben Gurion University and the work they were doing there and and water research and things like that and left some brochures and you know didn't I think think too much of it, uh, but the Marcuses decided and they talked to their daughter and and talked over with her and decided to leave their entire estate to the Ben Gurion University in the Negev to study water um, water conservation and desalination and things like that. So they managed to live another 15 years, I think. I think the wife was 104 or something like that. And uh, and when they both had passed away, Van Gorean University got a check for almost $500 million. So that was extremely unexpected. And uh, the university, after dedicating uh, this money to their research in, into water resources for Israel, 
uh, decided they that they should do a documentary. They should um, make a documentary on this couple. And my friend Brad and and Matthew Mashori, the director, were all just finished, just about finished with this film, and they had. Uh, they had scheduled to have an expert talk about German Jews in California and what they were like, and the person canceled in the last minute. So Brad knew from way back that that I'm interested in history and at least Austrian, sort of, you know, they at least speak German. So he thought maybe I knew something about the topic and I could come in and say something. So when they told me what it was about, I said, you know, I don't know anything about this these this couple. You know, how how am I supposed to say anything? They said, don't worry, Matthew, I'll ask you questions. It'll be fine. So so I got sort of seated and they they set up to film and then the power went out <laughs> and so while we were waiting for them to restore the power i said you know i just got back from this trip and my cousin serena had this idea about a documentary ha 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 so matthew then filmed me i answered some sort of general platitudes about german jews which happened to be exactly right for this couple they were interested in uh, they were very frugal and interested in charity and philanthropy and education and things like that um, so anyway, they were they were Matthew was intrigued by the idea of of this of doing another documentary tracing a family back 500 years because in his experience and he had done his own genealogical documentary uh, going back to Moldova or Bessarabia where his family was from that most Jews can't trace back that far maybe 150 200 years usually sometimes to the 1700s but to trace back to 1516 and the beginning of the of the ghetto in Venice was very interesting to him. He is a, a half Israeli, half American, um, and very interested in in Jewish history. And he thought this might be something worth pursuing. So we met several times, um, and then went on a a uh, scouting trip. And I have some pictures of the scouting trip, which I think I'll show now. And at the end, Ari, make sure we have enough time. I'll show everybody the trailer of what came out of this. So I, I think that's. A plan. So let me see if I can I can open this up and uh, and start showing you some slides because enough of me talking. So let me see where it is. I think it's this one here. And let me see if I can share screen. Sorry, I have to do this. Okay, and then maybe I can uh, play slide or something like that. Play from. Uh, it's it's in reverse order on this, so that's the last one. Okay, so so here does it? Can everybody see this? Ari, thumbs up. All good. Okay, so <laughs> just to give you an idea how long I've been doing genealogy, uh, this is me just before my eleventh birthday in front of an enormous uh, family tree that I had done. As uh, it started out, of course, as a school project, and uh, as I joke in the movie, but it, it's sort of true. You know, and when, when you're a little kid. And, and you find something that you're better at than everybody else, that becomes your thing. And so when I was given a family tree project and came back, most of, the, most of my classmates had you know father, mother, sister, dog. Uh, and I had this enormous tree because I'd asked my grandmother and she'd given me a lot of information. And my father's side, uh, there was a book about my grandfather, the composer. And so that had a lot of information. And so genealogy became my thing very early on. And this is, you know, I guess this is the evidence evidence of it. Um, anyway, so fast forward 50 years from this, uh, Matthew and I decided to take a, a scouting trip to, uh, to visit the places where we would have to go to trace this family line up. And, and the movie ended up being different than in a number of ways than what I had first thought it would be. Um, I thought of a genealogy documentary like, like the things you see on TV, if you've ever watched uh, you know, the Henry Louis Gates with with his um, program that he does where he sits a sits a uh, celebrity down and then they they show them a book with all this all these documents and they sort of zoom in and out. And so I thought of a genealogy documentary sort of you know zooming in and out of documents. That's not how it turned out at all. Um, I took I took Matthew then to the places where we would go to find the evidence for this very deep family line and to introduce him to the people uh, that were the people who helped me find these things, right? So I, I've done a lot of research over the years, but I rely on other people to, uh, to, to discover things. And so I wanted to introduce them to those people and they really, uh, they're, they're some of them very colorful. And so, uh, that's what he did. So here, here we are, um, I think this is the beginning of the trip in Vienna at the famous um, Central Cemetery, which is an enormous cemetery where I have uh, dozens of direct ancestors. Um, 
you know, leaving aside uncles, aunts, and cousins, there's just a, a lot of them there. So Wolfric Eckstein used to be the head of the uh, the record agency for the Jewish community in Vienna, and he's a genealogist and is uh, is the person you want to talk to if you're looking for something in Vienna uh, in genealogy. And so he's a good friend of mine for a long time, and he was our guide through the Central Cemetery. So he showed us uh, this one grave of my two great grandfather, my great great grandfather Joseph Nachod, uh, which is the line that we follow up in the film. Um, here we are at the at the grave of my great grandfather Samuel Schoenberg. Um, I'm just going to piece through, there's about 150 slides, so we're going to go quickly through this. This is the honorary grave of my grandfather, Arnold Schoenberg, um, and, and uh, it's, it's in a different section, not the Jewish section, but the section where they have all the honorary graves of all the, you know, sort of famous people, presidents, and things like that. Um, and this is uh, a place we, we also visit in the in the film, it's a um, the fourth gate, so a newer part of the Jewish cemetery. They have sort of two sec Jewish sections. It's the newer one, and uh, but these are graves that had been from a, a very old cemetery in a different location, and during the Nazi period, they were moved there, uh, perhaps by the Jewish community and buried, and they only were recently discovered uh, in the last twenty years. So here's Wolf Eric again smoking and uh and walking us through uh this is now the Veringer Friedhof which is a, another cemetery in Vienna that covers the basically the 19th century uh and this is a pile of graves that is in that cemetery uh because it was it was also bombed and damaged during the war um so we went there and looked through some things this is a friend of mine, Barbara Kintert, who uh, is featured in the film. She has done a lot of work on the Jewish families in their in her street where she lives and has done memorials and monuments about them. Uh, it's one of my favorite parts of the film is the is when she's showing us these monuments. That's that's a whole um, uh, installation with with four hundred keys for each family that was on the street. Uh, and we're walking here over to the old age home at the end of the street where they have the super old cemetery, um, which is where those old graves and that, that we found in the, in the wrong place were from originally. This is inside a, a uh, old, an old age home. So you imagine people are in the old age home and they have to look out on this old Jewish cemetery. Uh, it's being, being restored constantly. And I have, of course, ancestors who were buried here as well uh, from the 1600s. Uh, there's a man, I think we're going to see him in a little bit, who whose work is restoring those. Um, this is another. This is not in the film, but an installation in, in a Vienna subway uh, that shows all the, the deportation directions that people went, so where people were, were sent, all the different camps. And this is uh, Barbara in front of the new Holocaust Memorial in Vienna that lists all the 65,000 victims of the Holocaust there. So... My mother's uh, father was named Seisel, and that's his father, Zygmunt Seisel, sort of down near the bottom there, uh, born in 1871, and he was murdered in the Holocaust in Treblinka. And here's the, all the Schoenbergs and Schoenfelds, so just to give you an idea. Uh, I always take lots of pictures of Swedes when I'm in Vienna. It makes a nice little break in the uh, in the PowerPoint. Um, and uh, it's one of the one of the good one of the joys of doing genealogical research in this city. Uh, this is Gerard Galgush. He's a very good friend of mine and has he owns a uh, clothing sort of a cloth store where people make their own suits and he plays a key role in the film. Um, he is uh, not Jewish. Uh, his wife has some Jewish background, but he's not Jewish. And since he was very young, he's been researching the um, sort of upper middle class or upper class Jewish families that came to Vienna uh, because they all had been customers of his store and he inherited these books that list all of the old customers and have pieces of cloth, what they bought, and he wondered where they all went. And so as a, as a teenager, he started researching these families. And he's very interested because he owns his own business in the business relationships between all these different families. His, uh, the final volume of his book, I think it's over 5,000 pages of Jewish genealogy, is coming out at the end of this year. So he's really, his name is Georg Galgush. Uh, this is his home, and we film a, a scene here in the film 
Uh, and in the back, I talk about a little bit about the film, but they cut out some of it. There's a painting there of a woman named Hilda Spiel, who was my grandmother's best friend. And it was painted by another friend of theirs named Liesel Salzer. And as I mentioned in the film, this, the painter also painted pictures of my great-great-grandfather, my great-grandmother, my grandparents, my mother, and me as a kid. And I visited her once up in Seattle. She lived to be about 100 years old. So whenever I go visit Georg and I see this picture, I think, okay, it's like it's like a, a family friend. Um, here's Volferic and, and uh, Marie Trez, who's Georg's wife in their home. Uh, we visited Johannes Fleischmann. He's a violinist who also performed in the in the film. And this is him in his studio. He performs music by my grandfather as part of a scene in the film. And he brought us nearby, near his office um, or studio is my grandfather's birthplace, uh, the building where he was born. Uh, it's sort of a nice building. And my grandfather, the Schoenberg family, didn't have any money and they moved around a lot. So I think they probably were living in the basement uh, you know, sort of the maid's quarters uh, because it's a pretty nice building, but it's still there. So we go visit it. And that's the woman who who lives there now in that uh, in that building. This is a, another Holocaust monument in Vienna. It's not in the film, but it's in the, what's called the Judenplatz, the Jewish um, square. Uh, and it's on a location where there had been a, a syn synagogue in the 1400s in Vienna, and which was famously burned down um, perhaps with everybody inside. So it's a famous massacre during the, the Middle Ages uh, that took place here. And now they have this Holocaust monument there. We went and visited the Austrian National Library. And there I am. Uh, they were a little limiting on who could go in. It was still COVID time. Uh, and, and there I saw this, this uh, book that had been owned by my ancestors, the ones we find in Venice. Uh, and it has all these little little notes and graffiti, you know, like a, like when you're in high school and everybody doodles on it, right? That's what, what this one page looks like. Uh, and then there's these Kabbalistic charts in the back. Uh, here's a page where it says who it belonged to and that sideways mem there. Um, okay. So, so that's, that's an amazing uh, book, by the way, that's, that's 500 years old that belonged to my family. Um, we went, this is not in the film, we went to this um, hat maker, Mr. Shapiro, who, uh, uh, he didn't want me to take his picture, but I secretly took a picture, I'm sorry. Uh, he didn't want to be in the film, he would have been a great character, but he's the one that goes and restores that very old cemetery inside the nursing home, and uh, and has been doing, they, they dig up the graves and he pieces them back together and they restore them. And he's been leading that entire effort. And I wanted him to be in the film, but he he was afraid of cameras, unfortunately. Not of his phone, but of cameras. Uh, here's Matthew Mashori, finally, a first picture of him on the right with Marie Therese, uh, Gerard Graugush's wife. She's the, the new head of the theater museum here in Vienna. And she was showing this, this beautiful painting that, that uh, she found. I think the artist is, is named John Quincy Adams, but he's actually Jewish originally. <laughs> Changed his name to John Quincy Adams. Uh, it's very funny. Uh, so here's Matthew going into Georg's store. Uh, and here you see the, the store, Georg Gavrish's store, where they sell all this cloth uh, when you make your own suit. Uh, here's me in the Schoenberg Center with a big picture of my grandfather. Uh, the rest of the Schoenberg Center has an exhibit on my grandfather. So here's Matthew and the archivist, Teresa Moxinator, looking at it. Um, this is what an archive looks like. Uh, it's, this is the Arnold Schoenberg Center archive with all my grandfather's books and manuscripts. And Teresa was showing us sort of family related things that we could use in the, in the, uh, in the documentary, uh, some music and things like that. This is a, uh, if you do research in Vienna, this is where the city archives are. And it's a building that used to house natural gas, but they've turned it into offices and, uh, it's called the gasometer. And so you go inside and you can visit the city archives and order up all sorts of amazing things. Um, here I am looking at a book from, I think it's 1632, that is a property directory uh, of all the house, all the Jewish houses in Vienna. So it's sort of like a, a record book for, for property uh, and has a map, yeah. So we find lots of different documents. I don't need to, to go through all of them, but the, Vienna, for example, has these household registration cards that list, list the Nachod family from Prague coming to Vienna. Um, and uh, here we are 
been in the central in the only synagogue that still exists in Vienna from pre-war times. It's the the main synagogue uh, in the center of town, and it was next to a church, so it wasn't burned down on Kristallnacht. Otherwise, all of the all the uh, synagogues in Vienna were burned down, every single one. So this one is still there. There's Matthew again. More cake, right? So got to have a break at some point. Uh, and now we go to Prague. So here's Prague. How are we doing for time? We're pretty good. Okay. Um, this is in Prague. This is Lenka Matuskova, and it's the state archives. So it's a different feel from the from the Vienna archives. And Lenka, I first visited this archive in the in the nineties after after communism fell. I went to Prague doing research, and I've been there. Uh, and you can come in there, and you can they'll give you these really old books to look at, and you can sort of piece through them. Um, in uh, I'm a, a very involved in Austrian and Czech Jewish genealogy, obviously. And and uh, about 15 years ago, we funded, um, so we gave funds to the state archives so they could scan all these books. So we have these now online, so you don't have to visit, but it's nice sometimes to go. And sometimes you find new things. This is, for example, a big uh, census um, in uh, 1729. Uh, this is a document that's not in the film, but I allude to it. It's a they made statutes for the um, country Jews, the Jews outside of Prague in 1659. And my ancestor is the first signatory, uh, Joseph Levi Ausch. So we do visit uh, Joseph Levi Ausch's grave. And uh, this is why he's famous. Um, in the window in the back there, there's Julius Miller. You're going to see him a little bit, but they only allowed a certain number of people in at a time because it was still COVID raging. So he had to wait outside. Uh, sort of funny. Whoops. Uh, and this is another uh, Ivana Evalova, who's a professor at the university in Prague, who, who uh, has produced a lot of um, important work for us, in, like the whole census uh, of the Jews in 1794 and things like that. More cake. Uh, and we stopped. Uh, that's our, our local producer in the front. And then Julius Miller on the left talking to Matthew. So Julius is like Wolf Eric Eckstein, a very good friend of mine uh, and the best genealogist uh, in the Czech area. So I always refer people to him and he's helped me tremendously uh, over the years in solving all sorts of problems. And this is the, the other archive we went to next. It's a municipal archive and then another state archive, sort of a modern building. I'll just go through there. Um, this I found, found uh, they have like police files and all sorts of strange things here. Uh, so uh, in the, in the um, municipal archive, they have amazing books. They have, I think dozens of them that recorded transactions involving Jews, uh, a lot of mortgages and loans. So loans between Jewish families and mortgages. And they would write them out and record them in these giant books. And then if there was a later thing, there would be maybe an addendum or a reference to another page. This early book is all in Czech because at that time, uh, the, the, the ruling emperor in that area was Czech. Uh, and so it was all Czech speaking later. It's German. It sort of goes back and forth in that area. There's the buckle on this, on these old books. Uh, you can see how enormous it is when the archivist brings it out there. So this is in the, again in the Czech uh, municipal archives in Prague. Now here is the entrance to the Jewish Museum archive. If you've been to Prague, which I totally recommend, it has unbelievable things for Jewish history. And they one of the old synagogues they they have um, turned into an archive. And so here we are with the archivist Thomas Krakora um, and Daniel Polakovich going through all the records that they've produced for us for this uh, for this project, tracing my family back. That's Daniel Polakovich. He's um, originally from Bratislava and he reads Hebrew very well. So he was trying to figure out this uh, notes from, I think this is a seat book. Uh, it's either Beit Din, but no, I think that's a seat book. So they have for the, one of the synagogues, they have a records of who owned which seats seat in the synagogue because you could pass that down like property. Really interesting stuff. Uh, this is what the archive looks like there next to it, um, where they have an old synagogue, basically, that they've turned into an archive <laughs> with the banana boxes on the right there. Uh, so this is how they store all of their archives in an old synagogue. Obviously, not very many Jews left, but it was a big Jewish town. 
so this is uh, now one of the cemeteries in Prague, uh, not the old, old cemetery, but the uh, middle one that is um, next to a big radio tower. There's Matthew. He likes that picture, I think. Uh, and that's the chapel, I think, right there. Um, oh, that's the chapel in the new, the new cemetery. So like Vienna, there are a number of different cemeteries in Prague. There's the old one, which we'll see in a little bit, the middle one for the 19th century, and then the newer one for into the 20th century. And this is a cousin of mine. You see him pointing to his name, Peter Wilhelm, and it has the date, 1946, dash, and empty. He's already put his name on his own grave to, you know, in preparation. And he works as a volunteer at the cemetery, so he gives tours and, and guides people to graves there. He's from a family that had survived the Holocaust in, in the Czech Republic. Whoops, I went the wrong way, sorry. Uh, this on the right is Alexander Putik, who didn't make the cut in the film, but he is the scholar uh, professor at the Jewish Museum who publishes all of these scholarly articles on Jewish history, publishes a journal called Judaica Bohemiae, and uh, his name is Dr. Alexander Putik. Um, he's a converted converted to Judaism and uh, very religious and very not very very knowledgeable. Uh, so it's nice to have him help out. And he's showing us now the Pincus Synagogue. The Pincus Synagogue they've made into a memorial uh, where they've listed all the Jews in Bohemia, Moravia that were murdered uh, in the Holocaust, and it's a much higher percentage in the Czech areas than Austria because. They had less time to escape after the Nazis came in. The Nazis invaded Austria in March of 38, and it was March of 39 when they invite, invaded uh, Czechoslovakia. And of course, the war started in September with the invasion of Poland. So much more difficult. Now we're going to the uh, old, the beautiful old cemetery in Prague, uh, which, and there's Daniel Polakovich, who's going to show us some of the graves uh, in my family. This, these are very old graves from the 1500s. Uh, these dark black ones in the front there in the lower right. Um, and that's that's a grave of someone who was born in Venice and then died here in Prague. So which, this is how I knew that I could possibly trace back to back to Venice. Uh, here I am uh, again with some of the some of the family graves that are sort of bending over on each other. Uh, this is another museum. All of the, the synagogues are used as museums in Prague. Again, I recommend going. They have a video. We didn't use it in our film, but there was someone who had made a, a model of the entire uh, Jewish town, old city in Prague. And that's the only sort of remnant of what's left, or only way of seeing what's left. And they, they made a video where they sort of glide through that and show the whole Jew, old Jewish town. This is the Alt Neuschule. It's the oldest uh, continuously used synagogue in the world um, and uh, very beautiful. Supposedly the Maharal was the rabbi there. I think it's true, uh, uh, even though the stories about the Golem are not, but uh, but he was the, the famous rabbi, Lerf was, uh, was the rabbi there. We visited another part of the Jewish museum where they have textiles and they showed us um, a number of Torah curtains and things that my family had donated. Uh, this now we're in Theresienstadt, sort of gliding through here, um, and uh, which is a, a tough place for me to visit. Uh, there's a poster with my grandfather listed uh, for music there. Um, and then we visited a town outside of Theresienstadt where, uh, where this ancestor, Joseph Ausch, the one who signed those statutes in 1659 was buried. And that's Václav Kvatal and his his son who help um, document Jewish cemeteries in Bohemia and Moravia. They go, he goes and photographs and then maps out the cemetery and transcribes uh, and makes an index of all the graves. So it helps a lot for Jewish genealogy. This is Achab Heidler who does the same thing. Uh, and he does it purely as a volunteer. He's an actor, Czech actor in the North uh, in Bohemia. And as a hobby, he has been doing this for decades or two and has a website with thousands of graves and he likes to transcribe the entire gravestone. So all the Hebrew, he really loves that. Uh, he's an amazing, amazing person. So here they are at this grave that we found uh, in the snow. It's very beautiful. They have a chapel, a Jewish chapel there. Uh, some more food, pretty nice. Uh, here we are back down in, in Vienna and I guess I should go faster. This is Johannes Rice. He formerly the head of the Austrian Jewish Museum uh, in, in the Burgenland in Eisenstadt, and that's his partner, Trauda Triebel, who's a, a very good genealogist and, and says some wonderful things in the film. 
Um, she specializes in families like hers that are half Jewish, half not. Uh, she's able to sort of bridge and trace, trace through them. This is this beautiful chapel in Eisenstadt. Definitely you should go see it. Uh, absolutely gorgeous. And they have a cemetery there where Johannes Rice has, has done a lot of things. This is a castle uh, nearby in the Burgenland where they, in Forkenstein, where they store a lot of documents. Uh, they have a crocodile on the ceiling. Here they are showing me their, their archives. I'll just zip through these because we don't have that much time. Um, and then we went to Venice. There's my cousin Serena and Matthew. We're meeting Aldo Izzo, who is a, a Holocaust survivor from Venice, who has the keys to the cemetery there. There he is. Uh, we went to Florence and visited with Fabrizio Lely. And uh, he showed us a manuscript that my ancestor in Venice had made um, that's in the Medici Library now in, in Florence. Uh, and it's this amazing Kabbalistic manuscript, similar to what we saw in that Vienna library. Um, so when you see the movie, it really it really pops out. It's amazing. We had a little, little dinner there, a little more dessert. Uh, back in Venice, Matthew praying. We didn't, uh, and there's some people from Venice. So we filmed uh, the uh, the film a month or two, a few months later, starting in April, May. I got COVID, um, and. Uh, I think rather than show you shots from that, because it's already 10, 14, Ari, is that right? Let's let's break off now. I can show the trailer and we can do a little Q&A. Is that fine? That's great. Ari? Yeah, let's do the trailer. Yeah. And there's Sounds lots good. of questions that we have yeah. that we'd like to get okay. to. Okay. So, so sorry, I, I went a little too long, but that was the prep before the film. And now when you see the film, you'll you'll maybe know what's going on. So let me let me see if I can uh, find the trailer. Sorry, just to tell us, how long was that whole process? You, you just took us so through that, that. was just was a two-week uh, scouting trip. And then the filming took about six weeks. Uh, I got COVID in the middle of it. So that, that made it a little longer. And then my son, Joey, came along and they made the film a lot about my relationship with Joey and um, also these people that we met. And uh, it's just, it's, it's much different than I imagined, but it's done as a, a feature film. Uh, rather than a documentary. And, and so, before you show it, and, and what's the budget for this film? So we have an idea. Um, yeah, so the budget was uh, under $2 million, I guess. It's quite a lot. Um, and uh, it's for a documentary, it's a pretty high budget, I think. Uh, so it's done very professionally. There's also some recreations. He wanted to recreate me going to v to Prague in, in my 20s. Uh, and so there's a little of that also, which is a little corny. But uh, anyway, some people like it. Uh, let me see. Okay, so I am sharing screen now. Is that right? Can I play this? And okay, sorry, it's it's I'm having difficulty moving this over so I can do it. There we go. Okay, so let's go like that and play. Everybody, good. I would hardly believe that you were really the descendant of my hero. I'm just blown away. I'm about to leave for Vienna, and then Joey's going to come meet me. We're going on a little bit of a roots trip, looking at cemeteries and archives and documents, and we'll see how far back we get. So I get to show you all these neat things. You're yeah. weird. I, I'm weird. I know. There are just two types of people, the people who know they're crazy and the people who have no idea that they're crazy. I at least know I'm crazy. You will see things you would never expect to see. I always have been interested in memory. That was my dream as a little kid. It's in the soil, it's in the air. It is poetry. It is mystery. You must do it the rest of your life. Closed. Now what? We're going on a treasure hunt. 30 years ago, my neighbors told me, you have an American cousin here. Families were separated after World War II, and they really had no contact at all. The major point I think where Randy always does all his life is bringing people together. We're tracing our family history back 500 years. It's nice to know where I came from. Not a lot of people can say that. We're essentially missing so many generations because of these atrocities that happened in Europe. So many people came without family, without maybe memories. I'm the only person in 200 years who wants to look at this, right? He died 400 years ago, and here we are in front of one of his books. To believe that something this old was owned and created by someone that I share blood with. 
I had this dream that I would start painting some pictures of the characters you're like telling me about it becomes real, you know. I think for me at least, tracing my family history gives me an entree into the history of the world. It was like magic from Venice, they go to Prague, to Vienna, to Los Angeles. I think I was maybe more surprised at how enjoyable it was for me retracing some of the steps with my son. Looks a little expensive. We'll take it. It's that time of life when you start thinking about, okay, who am I going to be and what am I going to do and how am I going to do it? I will always remember it. You could wear that to the Met Gala. <laughs> I don't think I want to wear it. Uh, I don't want to end up like Florida Loco. He was burned at the stake after all. <laughs> Great. So uh, okay. please let's let's do some Q and A. If you have questions, please sure. drop them in, and uh, let's put you in the hot seat here. So <laughs> number one, who was Fioretta? <laughs> like so, Fioretta. Who is Fioretta, this person that you found? Yeah, Fioretta is the the oldest ancestor that we find something physical from, um, and and uh, in in Venice. And she is the wife of a, whoops, whoops, am I playing something? I'm sorry. Uh, she's the wife of a rabbi. What is going on? I'm sorry. I'm going to figure out where this is. It's playing a piece by my grandfather. Schoenberg is one of the extremists. Here. There we go. Okay. Sorry. I guess this, the, the video went on. Your grandfather wanted to be in the yes. program, I guess. Yeah. So Fioretta is the wife of a, uh, a rabbi um, named... Rabbi Eliyahu Menachem Halfon, who was a very interesting and important rabbi in Venice. His father-in-law, so you read his father, is also a rabbi, a doctor, and astronomer. Uh, he had been the chief astronomer to the King of Naples. And when the, the Spanish king took over southern Italy, the Inquisition was brought into southern Italy, and all the Jews from southern Italy had to come up north. And that's when these two families uh, came up to Venice. So the earliest record of them is 1517, and the ghetto is open 1516. So they're right there in the beginning of the ghetto in, in Venice. And Fioretta is sort of the last uh, remnant of that in Venice. The... Um, uh, just to jump around, well, I'll sure. get there, people that. Um, so traveling with your son, Joey, now, how old was he when, when you filmed this? So Joey uh, was 18 years old. He was just finishing high school. And uh, initially the plan was for the film to be with me and my two cousins, Arnie and Serena, sort of like the three musketeers. And then I got COVID. And so we delayed things and it was right at the end of Joey's school year. And so uh, Joey was going to just come visit, but then we got uh, permission for him to stay. And the filmmakers changed the whole film around to focus a, a lot on Joey because he's a little bit like the, the average viewer, right? A little skeptical. Am I going to be interested in this? Why does it matter? Why is it important? And uh, and so he reflects a little bit, I think, of that uh, sort of skepticism of the whole ordeal. And then uh, as you go further in, he gets sort of deeper and deeper involved. And I think the viewer does too. So I think it it, it works uh, as a narrative uh, trick. And he's also pretty good in in, in the film and says some, says some funny things. So, uh, and he enjoyed it, certainly. I should add the film is getting very good reviews. I'll share some of the reviews with everybody. Yeah. So yeah, so far um, we've only got. I'm, I'm sure we'll get some bad reviews eventually, but so far everybody likes it. <laughs> so so did um you know I traveled that, right? I think I mentioned to you I traveled with my daughter when Clara to Eastern Europe to Lithuania and Poland. She said, "Thanks, Dad. All my friends are going to Paris and Italy this summer, and you're taking me to see right. concentration camps and forests." <laughs> Um, and she was, in fact, tried to get out of it. I don't know if Joey tried to get out of your experience. My daughter tried to literally not go to the airplane. Um, <laughs> well, he, he wanted a trip to Europe, and and this was sort of the price that he had to be dragged along. Uh, uh, and at least he went to like uh, Italy and uh, Czechoslovakia right. and other places like that. Um, <laughs> did did he? Uh, so eventually, I mean, I, I saw something on that red carpet. He had a fancy outfit. Is he now like a movie star? Is he very happy? Is he? Yeah, like, so what, it, one of the scenes we did was we go into Georg Galgish's shop, you know, and so so rather than only talk about genealogy, which is what Georg and I usually do, uh, we had Joey look at fabric for, for a coat because Joey is a little bit of a style guy. And so he uh, 
he picked out a fabric for a suit and and then you know we finally made you know finished the movie and I uh oh I guess I got to get him that suit <laughs> so so we we got that suit for the premiere uh, in Zurich and he had the big cape he designed and yeah anyway I, I think you posted um, a, some of video of him on the yeah no, he wants to pretend to be a star so maybe he so be one. is it I mean my family's one hundred percent Lithuanian. And I went back and I, I I got back pretty far. I got back to 1740, which is pretty good, I think, for Lithuania. Yeah. yeah. It, because your family is Viennese. Is that because of all the records? Is that is that why it was easier for you to get back? I mean, is that normal for other families to go back for? Or are you really uh, an outlier being able to get back so far? I, I am and I'm not. So it, it really depends on location, genealogy, right? So if you're from a town where records are available, uh, great. And it's not just Vienna, there are good records in Prague and Frankfurt and Amsterdam. The big cities tend to have more records. Um, but it's, you know, it's possible. I have some line into 1600s in the in the middle of Poland also. So it's it's uh you know, it just depends. Um, you have to be lucky. And am I an outlier? Well, I had uh on Genie, we have all these family trees that are linked together, and I had the the head of it. Tell me how many descendants are there of the Maharal, the famous rabbi in Prague, and there are over a million people who are descended from the Maharal, supposedly. So uh, a lot of people can can trace back to 1500s, um, and uh, and but I, you know, it's it's one thing to sort of rely on what others do, and it's another to actually go and take the steps to actually look up the documentation. Um, what what I do try to point out to people though is that 500 years we have tens of thousands of ancestors potentially and and so it's you know we're all related to all of these people back there it's not a uh it's not unique uh at that at that point because you have so many ancestors you're going to have some who are big and famous rabbis and whatever and you're going to have many who are not uh but it's not as if you don't have any of these these interesting ancestors it's just hard sometimes to trace to them when i was um before our big trip to Lithuania and Poland, I spent a lot of time researching my family history. And I know I've known there's always one person in the family that does it. And everybody else makes fun of that person, by the way. So I am that one person in my family and no one cares. In fact, I'm right. the butt of jokes. When we get together, they always say, Ari, we'll stand up now and give us the family genealogy. And they all <laughs> groan. Um, is this going to make people, is this film now going to be seen by your family and make you kind of, you know, people more interested in genealogy, you think? And are you like, I mean, are you the person they make fun of in the family right now because of genealogy? Oh, de definitely. I've been, I, I I mean, that's me. And I'm not sure it's going to convert anybody in the family, maybe Joey a little bit, but the, the, one of the themes in the movie is how do you pass on the information to the next generation? Because yes, in every family, there's sort of one torchbearer who remembers the stories and tries to pass it on. And what's the best way to do that? How do you get the next generation involved? Um, and the history of Judaism is the history of passing down our story. If, you know, the Bible itself is a genealogical book. A third of it is is so and so begat so and so begat. Right? It's 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 all genealogy in there. It's a, it's a family story, and it's been passed down from generation to generation. So uh, so that act of transmission of memory is the is one of the core themes in the in the film. Um, so I don't expect to. You know, persuade my cousin, my cousins, all or my even my siblings that it's cool and neat. But maybe there'll be someone in the next generation or the generation after that who will sort of rediscover the work that I did and and be also interested and find it useful. I think what's unusual about you is that you started at such a young age because I started, I guess, when I was basically fifty. So I lost a lot yeah. of information in my family that I had to try to figure out. You started when you were how old were you in that picture? Uh, I was uh, almost 11 in the picture I started when I was eight. It's actually, we all do start at eight, right? Everybody gets that school assignments, just, you know, you, you don't continue. <laughs> and so uh, there are a few of us, uh, I go, as I said, to these genealogy conferences, and I used to be sort of the young Turk at the conference. And now I'm, you know, one of the old guard and there are people in their twenties uh, and thirties coming to these conferences. So it's not exclusively a retirement age activity and uh and for those of you who are sort of thinking oh you may do it um there's no time like the present you can get a lot of help and uh, the longer you wait the harder is it is because you lose the ability to ask other people uh, and get help from other people so i would recommend people dive right in 
Can you tell us a little bit about what you worked on on Genie in with regard to so people know kind of your yeah expertise? So, so uh, when you do genealogy, you know, you start with a sort of small tree and then it gets bigger and bigger. And of course, uh, computer programs have been developed. One of the first ones was actually developed by the Beit HaFutzot, which is now the Anu Museum. Uh, but there's one uh, company called MyHeritage, which is an Israeli company that bought a company based in Burbank, California, called Genie.com, G-E-N-I.com. And Genie is the one I use. It's the best tree building platform. So it allows you to work collaboratively with other people, which is which I really like because I like to take advantage of their work. They can take advantage of my work. And it's I look at it like a giant jigsaw puzzle, right? So imagine you have millions of pieces strewn on the table and everybody's trying to put them together. And ultimately you have this big mass, connected mass, and you're just trying to add to that connected mass of people. That's what the Genie World Family Tree is like. And um and if you're on that, it's relatively easy because most families, most Jewish families are already on it. It's very easy to find out how you're related to any other family. And I, I think I was going to mention that that web application I did for, for Anu. Uh, I, can maybe, I, can, I can share that link and people can, uh, can maybe try that out for themselves. So if you're on Genie, all you need is your username and password. And it will, uh, this will sort of run your connection to all the famous Jews in the museum and up to about a thousand different people. So Albert Einstein and Barbara Streisand, and it doesn't matter if you're Ashkenaz or Sephardi or Mizrahi or Iranian or Moroccan or wh wherever you are uh, in the Jewish world, everybody's sort of connected cousin of cousin of cousin. And uh, and it's sort of fun. You'll, I mean, I, I find it very fun and I hope other people will too. And uh, I'm excited for people using it in the museum uh, there because as I said, you can not only find out how you're related to the people on the walls in the museum, but also the other people walking around the museum at the same time. So you say, oh, you're my third cousin's uh, ex-wife's uncle's wife's third cousin, right? And everybody in the Jewish world is connected that way. It's just automatic. That's cool. Well, sh I saw you, sh you share it there. We'll share it in the follow-up. So last few minutes, let's see what we want to ask. Um, well, I was going to say that my seven-year-old came home with his assignment for, uh, he said, hey, dad, I'm supposed to do a family tree. And I said, oh, that's great, since I've worked on mine. And mine is not quite as long as yours, but it's massive. I have just on the rook side, I have like 2,000 relatives. And so he pulled it out and it said, like, uh, name your parents, your siblings, and your grandparents. And I was like, what? I said, no, yeah. we're going to give them something out. So I printed out the, <laughs> you know, I said, show this to your teacher. Um Okay, so people are asking about uh, the woman in gold. They want to know, um, where is it right now? Is it still in New York? Is it on permanent display at the um, Noya Gallery? Is that it? Did I get it right? The woman, in gold, the woman in gold is uh, uh, on permanent display at the Noya Gallery. And it's uh, you can see it on 86th and 5th. Upper East Side. Uh, make a reservation in the in the cafe, the Sabarsky Cafe at the bottom, because it has very good... Uh, Apfelstrudel and other Austrian delights. So right. that's, that's, and then people want to know: um, Are you best friends with Ryan Reynolds? Did you get a chance to hang out with Ryan Reynolds? Do you think he looks like you for the film? And if you haven't seen the film, I'll put, you should see Woman in Gold, by the way, because this is yeah. it's about Randy, so it's pretty funny. It, it is about me, I guess. Um, Helen Mirren, I got to speak with much more, and she has a new film, Golda, out. Which oh, I, I saw that. Yeah. Very timely now because it's all about the Yom Kippur War. Um, but uh, Ryan Reynolds, I met one time when he was filming. He, for some reason, uh, he, I, I think he, his wife had a kid. There was a whole bunch of things going on, so he wasn't at the premieres. But I, I was there at one of the days where they were filming, and they had invited me to come. So, so I went. It was in Beverly Hills, actually. And uh, you know, I got dressed. I went over there, and he finished the scene. And he walked over to me. He pointed to what I was wearing, and then pointed to himself. We were wearing the exact same clothes. He was dressed as sort of a geeky lawyer type, like me, uh, with khakis and a, and a you know regular shirt. And uh, and so he pointed. He said, "Nailed it, right? Like you know, I got it exactly right." And uh, so he has a good sense of humor, and I think he did a he did a, a very good job. He wasn't the person that I envisioned playing me in a in a movie. Um, you know, he's a lot better looking and taller. I thought it would be some. Uh, someone like Jonah Hill <laughs> playing me, but uh, but not bad to have Ryan Reynolds and and Helen Mirren did a terrific job playing Maria Altman. Um, and the two of them, I think, had, a, had a, a good chemistry. So it turned into a very successful movie, much more successful than I ever would have imagined. 
big movie, big cast. So if you haven't seen it, it's worth streaming. I, I still get out. I still get messages from people watching it. So it'll air on TV and whatever Argentina or Israel, and people will look me up and send me messages saying how much they like it. So that's that's I think unusual for for a film that's now eight years old. And uh, so I'm very very proud uh, of the job they did. People have asked. Um, you really spoke very quickly when you showed us the experts that you met with. Sorry. Can you? Yes. Do you have a list of them that you can email me that I could share with people? Because I assume people are doing research and they want to be able to hire these experts as well. That's a good question. I don't think I have a, a list of all of them. I do have a presentation that I make uh, with the sort of the archival sources uh, that that I do in. Um, I can maybe find it even all, while we're talking about it. You could, yeah, you can send it to me afterwards. I'll send it as a follow up email. Yeah, and then, but, is this going to go? You think this is this is this movie going to go to a streaming platform after it's shown? So, as, as I understand it, I, I'm not the produ- you know the producers who are deciding this, but as I understand it, the trajectory is that we do these festivals, right? We've done three or four, and we have a few more, uh, and there may be some more after that. And then now we're we're talking about um, distribution. Rights, and so they're talking to people who who are who do that, and it should be on one of the platforms eventually. There may be um, uh, theatrical showings. We we already have a week set up starting December first at the Lemley Theater in Los in West Los Angeles, and possibly also in the, in the Valley, San Fernando Valley, uh, and Sino. And I think we're going. We're, I'm sure we're going to have a week in Vienna. Uh, I'm here sort of setting that up in March, and and possibly in New York. So there will be. Um, some some i guess some small theatrical releases some festivals and then ultimately it'll be available on uh, on video on demand somewhere maybe in the spring they say but you know I, that hasn't been decided yet so are you, eager, are you yeah I'm are you eager. coming down here are you going to come down to the um oh i'll be here, there in newport. in newport oh you will yeah, I'll, be, I'll be there in newport my son uh nathan will be there with me not joey because joey's in culinary school in new york but Nathan uh, is at, at Chapman in Orange County, so he'll be there with me. And uh, we okay, have to so I'm them. I'm sending like Rob Fesher. I'm sending the Chatlins, Deborah Goodman. Who else, guys? So you're gonna just get tickets. So yeah. can they come up to you? And, oh, Jana is definitely coming, and Jana uh, may take your picture that you can see. Jana is from Czechoslovakia. She has oh, a crazy okay. story, crazy story from Czechoslovakia. I don't, any, I don't see any of the chat, so I, I guess it's no, no. I can, I'm looking at the videos. Faith Herschler. I'm looking at all the people who are from. Um, um, Orange County that I can see. Okay. So if they come down, they just have to come over and say, hi, we're from CSP I, Orange County, I, right? I predicted it's going to sell out very quickly because I don't think they have a very big theater there. And we were we were sold out in Cincinnati and Woodstock and Anu. Okay. Uh, we had over well, 300. Okay, so guys, stuff. please get the tickets right now. I say, you know, but but I mean, I don't get a percentage. I'm not, I get nothing out of it other than I, I would either. be there. <laughs> I would be the there. So, <laughs> I would be there if I can. So I'm not there. So Jan, I'm depending on you to get the group together and get a photo, please. Is that okay, Randy? Can they get a photo with yes, you? Yes, absolutely. I will be there. I'll, I'll have a little time afterwards before right. I have to run to the airport. So Vivian, yeah, it's showing at the Newport Beach Film Festival on the right. 19th. So it's showing next in eight days. Um, I put the link in. I'll put it in again in the follow up so people can get the can get the tickets right away. But everyone, if you know who Yana is, find Yana and get a picture. I don't know. You'll be so. Are you like? What are you doing? What do you do yeah. for the premiere? I mean, are you talking to the audience? Are you like what? Yes, there'll be so that we'll have the screening and then we're going to have a Q and A and I think there'll be a reception afterwards outside the theater. Uh, that's the current plan and uh, look forward to seeing everybody there. And if not there, then at Doc LA uh, ten days later, downtown LA. But uh, first, first things first, Newport Beach should be fun. It should be a lot of fun. So yeah, oops, wrong thing here. So I mean, my last question for you is: so when we were at Princeton University and you're rooming with Danny Edelman. Did you like tell him about all these things? And did he even listen to him? Or because I never I I I know you talked about your grandfather a lot. I remember that. <laughs> but I do not recall um you talking about genealogy. And but I probably yeah. wouldn't have been interested. So I don't know whether there was, could... I mean, that, long story short, we had an uh, assistant dean of students who came to me and said, you know, uh my family's also from Austria. And I said, Oh, what was your, the name? She gave me her mom's maiden name, and I said, Ooh, I think. I think I, that's the name in my family too. And it turned out our, our great, great grandfathers were brothers. So, mm. so I was doing a little genealogy also in, in college at that time. But anyhow, you know, if you know all 16 of your great, great grandparents and you know the maiden names of the, of the great, great grandmothers, you're more likely to find uh, people who are. Well, right. I will say, since I have spent quality time with my family history, 
that it's very hard to find the names of the women. <laughs> I can't, it's just the male line, you can find them and you can find their last name, but the women are, are very much lost to history, particularly in Eastern Europe. Right, right. It's it's uh, it's sometimes more difficult. Uh, on the other hand, when you do find a grave, for example, for a woman, you're going to get more information because you have usually the husband and the father, whereas the, on a on a male person, it doesn't list the wife. So um, when we found, you know, Fioretta's grave, for example, not to give everything away, um, it has her husband's name on it, right? So um, sometimes it's good to be a woman in genealogy. You never know. <laughs> it's it's uh, it. There there's some things that you only find. And as a matter of fact, in Hungary, the graves. Uh, of even the man list the mother and not the father. Uh, so there's certain certain communities where where you're more likely to find the woman's name than the man's name. So, well, thank you for taking our mind off the crisis situation, the horrible yes. situation in Israel for just mine too. An I, for an hour, I didn't think about it. So that was right. Good. Sorry for bringing it up, Ben. Uh, I know that you, I know <laughs> that you're like yes. I know you're in yeah. PTSD because you were right there in at least in bit, Israel. A little, a little bit, um, yeah. A little bit right. Um, yeah. But thank you for for hanging out with us um, and sharing you, your story. Everyone. Looking forward to seeing the film. I hope that people in Orange County, you'll see it. And if you're not in Orange County, you go to LA. If you're not in LA, find out where it's going to be showing and um, keep up the good work, Randy. Boy, you've really been doing some crazy things since yep. the last yep. 40 years. I try to keep busy. Okay. Well, <laughs> I'm wishing you and your family health in this new Thank year, happiness and um Again, thank you for the break. We look forward to, uh, I look forward to sending Yana and the Orange County group to see you in Orange thank County you. next week, okay? Trust me, Yana, thank I, you. Faith, you go too, and Deborah and Chatlins <laughs> and Rob Fesher and Vivian. Yeah. Vivian yeah. lives in Newport Beach. You can probably walk to the theater. Which, which, is it the, which theater is it? The main, probably the, is it at Fashion Island probably, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, I think it's, it's at, at Fashion Island. Fashion Island, I think, yeah. yeah. Yana's Vivian waiting. will bring her whole book group okay <laughs> we'll come up to you there's yana okay. she, she, <laughs> she, she, she'll be there she'll be there great well i'm, I'm really thank looking you. Thank to you. seeing everybody down there i'll bring Thanks. you some pastry oh you okay Yana's like, yes she's a good baker okay you, you see you see what i like yes <laughs> yeah absolutely and i make it and i bake it oh, i met well, you before so i'm looking forward to it excellent okay, okay. people I got to run and do some you, work. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Okay. Bye, everyone. Be safe Have in Vienna. Good day. Thank you. Bye-bye.